John, thank you ever so much for accepting this invitation and, and for coming up to Lincoln today. I just heard that John has just arrived from Boston yesterday. Boston. Boston, yeah, which is a long, another longer trip. Everyone has been, I think, just having a lot of trips around to come to this uh, event we're having. John is the Director of Sports and Recreation and Entertainment at HOK uh, in London. Uh, we've been having speakers from HOK over the last six years. There was always someone who just said, yes, we will come up and, and, and see you guys. So we thank you very much for making it within his very, very busy schedule. And the amount of projects I'm sure he's looking after and managing is such a big thing to spare some of the, your time and come and speak to students. But I think it's, it's those practitioners in real, real life who come and talk about their experience who make a difference in, in how you guys see architecture and, and practice. John is the director of HOK, as I said, Entertainment and Recreation Practice. He's based in London with more than 15 years of experience developing high-profile facilities for a range of professional sports and entertainment activities. His work helps to spur urban regeneration and economic development in local communities. John is advancing uh, the next generation of sports and entertainment venues, which become destinations in their own life. You, uh, you guys want to go and see Manchester United Old Trafford, they're going on Sunday. So it's becoming also a venue for, uh, I think, to go for historical sort of things or for you as tourists who want to see what's happening. His extensive experience in the design of sport and entertainment facilities, including arenas and stadia, Formula One circuits, conference and exhibition centers. Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, John. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. So my, my name is John Rhodes, as, as I suggested. I'm, I'm an old technology designer. Um, I work for a company called HOK. So HOK, this is a very brief background, is an international design firm. Uh, we, you know, we've got offices across the world, which are particularly strong in the US. Uh, so I basically I lead the sports and entertainment um, projects from, from London, which covers actually the Middle East and Africa as well as as far as sort of China and such. Like. So I, I'm very lucky to have worked quite quite across the world, world and globally as well. Um, my background, as I said, I'm an architect. I trained as an architect, but I also quite like sports. So I don't know if anyone here quite likes sport. My sport in particular is rugby, and I was lucky enough uh, 2003 to go to the Rugby World Cup final in Australia. And looking enough to see England, I'm, I'm English, I'm actually from Yorkshire, so I'm from this part of the world, uh, to actually see, basically, England win in, in, in a stadium. And from that day on, I quite fancied the idea of actually becoming a sports architect. So that's kind of my, my story as well. Um, we work on all sorts of different types of sport projects. So on the very large scale, stadiums, you know, we talked about the, the big football clubs, you know, and my colleagues in the US have just done the, the MetLife Stadium, which is 84,000 seats for the Jets and the New York Giants, um, through to some smaller theatre kind of projects, you know, not dissimilar to the, to the auditorium that we were just talking about. Um, but what I quite like about our projects is that they're, they're very much experiential projects. They're buildings that, or places that you go to experience something. So be it your sporting event, be it a music event, or such like. And, and there's various projects in between. So today I'm going to focus a little bit on arenas, but I'm also going to talk a bit about the World Expo that we've been designing. Uh, as well, I've we got time, I'll just touch on a bit of Formula One as well, just for fun. Okay, so the, um, really the, the idea is, is sports is quite interesting. So sports architecture has really evolved massively in the last sort of 20 or 30 years. Historically, they were just seen as engineering facilities or buildings, very practical, very delivered and such like. But now they've really used as this idea of the, as a cornerstone or an anchor for regeneration and as a cornerstone for communities. So the idea that a stadium can actually, or an arena, can be actually a, 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 an anchor for a cluster of all sorts of different facilities and, and aspects. So from residential hotels through to medical research and, and education. So what we're particularly interested in is actually designing these buildings that can actually influence the urban fabric around them, influence the actual regional content, and hopefully create re regeneration and, and opportunities mm -hmm. around them. Um, so there's great examples of this. So arenas, just to give you an idea of what an arena is, if you know the O2 London, it's basically a big sort of performance space. Um, this, this was my previous company. Um, arenas are particularly interesting because they not just like sporting projects where you have a stadium which has football or rugby. Um, they have a very diverse program. 
so uh, that means they have a, a lot of event uh, calendar days every year. So they have a, a much more opportunity to create regeneration and footfall through a, through a community than maybe a stadium does. So the arenas we're going to talk about today are very much this idea of, of, of entertainment-based um, venues, but also they can deliver sport, they can deliver family shows, things such as Cirque Soleil, or one of my favourites, Walking with Dinosaurs. Very difficult to work out the trapping of a brontosaurus. Um, but the, the, the intention is that the, these arenas become this, this, this district anchor. So around the, the actual arena itself, there's this great opportunity to create you know, public space. There's opportunity to create uh, food and beverage outlets and such like. But the, you need to design them in such a way that they can leverage that integration with the local community. Um, so historically, arenas were a North American kind of typology. Um, they, they, they were really more recently designed for North American sports, so uh, basketball, ice hockey, and such like. Um, and that because of that, they, they evolved around the field of play, which is very much like basketball, ice hockey. So their form was very much in the round or, or, or tradition. Now, more recently, we've been testing those typologies in relation to where they are geographic, geographically. So um, Ryan was talking about Leeds Arena, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as the architect of Leeds Arena. And, and in particular, um, you know, it, it, in sort of you know, this part of the world, we don't really play ice hockey, and, and you know, I'm not tall enough to play basketball. So the, the really, the, you know, the entertainment side is where we're trying to focus the, the, the sort of typological design. So this this discussion has actually gone on for years, you know. So is it Roman amphitheatre? Uh, sorry, a, a Greek amphitheatre versus a Roman sort of Colosseum type discussion. And um, what we're really trying to do at the moment is explore the connection between these two very different typologies and create the next sort of generation of, of venues. So how do these sort of typologies develop? So this is a North American uh, arena based on ice hockey in this particular concept. This is what my colleagues did in the US. But actually, we're, we're sort of looking at some Leeds Arena um, where we actually focus more on entertainment. Now that's a very different typology because if you're, you know, if you're, uh, if you don't have a field of play to fix your design around, you can actually be far more flexible. So you can see Leeds Arena here. You can see it's that green thing in the middle. Um, the um, Leeds, Leeds was a fascinating project where, again, historically arenas in, in North America are pretty much basically uh, typically built on the outskirts of, 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 of urban development, on the outskirts of cities. And that's because they need to require lots of car parking and they're connected with the ring road systems and such like. And I think, but now, I think there's a movement towards actually creating these buildings mm -hmm. right in the city centre. So in Leeds, we, we put it right in the city centre. Um, and it was a very tight site, but the, the actual design, because we evolved the design, looked at the typology differently, that we moved away from the North American style to actually what I'm going to talk about, super fan or a super theatre. We could actually sit it, sit it in a very tight urban site. Now this caused lots of challenges as well. We've got acoustic issues with the Opal 3, the student residential towers next door. We had to deal with that with the design. Uh, and also the way that public space works and the way people move through, through the city. So at Leeds Arena, we had this idea that we would create a venue which was specifically for entertainment. You can still do sport, you can still do you know, tennis, basketball, boxing and such like. It's very, it's very good for boxing actually. Um, but primarily it would be focused on an event calendar which was about entertainment. So basically musical performances, family shows, all of the things I just talked about earlier. And this meant that everyone was facing forward. So you're facing the performance in front of you very much like today. So this meant kind of different sort of setup. So this was a photo we took uh, with Elton John playing. So you can imagine this is 12 and a half thousand people. This is a wall of people. You're a performer playing in front of this wall of people. It, the, the close proximity is an incredible venue to go and experience music at. And of course, this also helps with the acoustic performance. So historically, venues such as opera houses or theatres have been pretty much limited by their natural acoustic performance. So essentially, the space is kind of limited to about 2,000 people, 2,500 people. Uh, because any, any more than that, you start to get echoes or what's called yeah. slapback and such like reverberation within the space. Now, with, with modern modelling, acoustic modelling and such like, we can start to look at how the space can actually perform. And we can you know, adapt that space using uh, acoustic insulation and absorption to create a, a space that is wonderful to actually perform in and listen to music in. And really, the other aspect is, is to create a building which is very functional, which can actually drive a business. So 
the idea that all of our business, all of our clients have a commercial um, you know, requirement. They need to make a living, they need to maintain their business, and to do that, we need to create buildings that help them do that, help them create, you know, create revenue and such like. And, and in particular, this idea with arenas is that they need to be very adaptable, very flexible, but also they need to uh, have a rapid turnaround from different functionalities. So one day you might have uh, you know, a pop band playing, the next day you might have a sporting event. They need to turn around rapidly and quick. And we like this idea of creating what I call an arena machine, which is a building which is really efficient, really focused on what it's trying to deliver. And then that adapts to the architecture itself. So you can see here, this is the, the first BIM, BAM BIM model. Uh, image that we did some time ago. We worked with BAM to really develop their, their BIM approach, as we discussed in the wrong way. Oh, sorry. Um, so really, this, this, this sort of thing comes into the planning of the building as well. How do the loading bays look? How, where are the accommodation? Where is the venue? Where are the venue staff? So you, you really got to get a grip on how these, these aspects work together, or pull them together to bring them something beautiful as well. So Leeds itself, Leeds Arena, um, I actually designed my previous company, but my team came across with me to my current company, um, at which is a HOK. But we, we basically we, we designed the arena so it nestled into the hillside, into the, the natural topography of the site. Now, what was great about that was that actually when you go to, to experience the venue, you enter sort of mid-level, which means that you, you don't have to go lots of steps to get to the top of the thing. You go, you're kind of halfway up. But there's this wonderful, it actually works far better in, in reality than we expected. But as you come in, you wander into this wondrous space, which is a lot bigger than you expect. So there's always this kind of like, how did that happen? Um, but it also means that the way that this building engages with it, it's the natural topography, the natural urban frame, is key. And really, the idea that the, the functional form of this building, the super fan, how the performance venue itself relates to the architectural shape, form, and, and, and approach was key as well. So we really looked at articulating this inside externally within the architecture. So the form being very much driven by the actual internal stuff, uh, the, the internal uh, layout of the building. So you can see here how the, the actual form is going. Now one of the reasons to do this was that we didn't have very much money. So traditionally on an arena, uh, something like the O2 arena, would cost probably around about £8,000 a seat. Um, we had a budget on this for about four and a half thousand pounds. So we had to work really hard to get this up on, on budget. And to do that, we really looked at the form of the architecture to take precedence in some ways, rather than the materiality. Because materials are expensive and they're big buildings. So your choice of material has a massive impact on the budget. So this really just gives you a, a sort of view of the inside of the venue. And this is with the retractable seats pulled back. So it's kind of a, almost a, a wraps around you if you're, if you're performing space inside. The other approach we had to, to actually creating an economic building is to look at where we spend the money. So again, I talk about this idea of experiential architecture. It's a building you go to experience something. So let's spend the money where people actually engage with the, the building, where you touch the building. So we focused on the, the front facade of this, of this building and the way it addressed the gaps at the front. And then we, 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 you know, we spent more money there in, in, in zone D rather than the other elements of the building. This allowed us to, to create this elevational hierarchy. The main scale of the building was then look, looked at slightly differently. So we really focused the energy on the front of the building, but the, the rest of the building, we, we, our approach was to really see how it could actually sort of blend into the urban, urban landscape. And they're very big buildings, these. So to put a very big building in the city centre is challenging. So one of the things we looked at was, uh, strangely enough, was the way that during the First World War, they used to use dazzle painting, dazzle camouflage, on, on, on First World War battleships to break up the scale and form within, uh, with, uh, out of the sea to make it very difficult for the um, submarines to target them. So taking the same principle, this is a painting by um, Edward Wordsworthy, 1890. We looked at how we could actually break the building down in terms of scale, and it, and it just kind of worked by actually creating a pixelation for the, the, the elevation which works on a macro level, but also works on a, on a close proximity. Um, we then focused on the front of the building, the, the actual the, the approach, the main elevation. And the idea for that was a, was a kaleidoscope. So you could actually focus and change the shape, the form, the actual appearance of this building in response to the performance that was happening that day. So using LED technology and such like, we create this very sort of dynamic facade, which can change and, and, and color. And to do that with BAM, the guys who were just talking previously, BAM were the contractors. We did a wonderful mock-up. 
And really, we're using layering and different lighting strategies to come together to create natural complexity. And this was a mock up, and it was wonderfully successful. I'm quite delighted by how I can enable people to deliver. So, this was a concept image we did before we designed it. And then, actually, the final construction image is some time off. Shortly after construction, you see the building and how it can actually change its color and facade. So it can change, you know, it's, it's, it's St. Patrick's Day in Ireland, it turns green, and it's Red Nose Day, and it's a Charity Day, it turns red, and such like. What, what we found very interesting, though, is how the building is actually used as a sort of social meeting point because of its ability to respond in terms of color. They can change color in response to different events. So people go there to celebrate, you know. Um, comic relief where it's the red nose day that turned red and that sort of thing. And it, it's kind of wonderful in, in, in that aspect. So we didn't expect it at all. Now we also looked at the way that this building engages with the landscape. So traditionally arenas are a black box with performance inside, but we looked at how we could actually create windows that look out over the, 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 the city. And in some ways it's got a gothic quality to the building where we were looking to use economic materials in a dynamic sense. So taking a very simple glazing Chico system at 45 degrees and then applying some tinted glazing, we very economically brought some real character to this building, which has an organic quality, but also a kind of gothic quality as well. So the light coming into the space is, is quite interesting. So this was an image, and it, the actual, I should have a photo of but it's very, the space is very similar to this. There's this wonderful light quality in these spaces. We're spending very little money on the finishes, but we're really using the actual light in the spaces around. So what was great is that basically when we were building it, um, building the arena, there was lots of talk in the industry about this new typology, this new configuration of the arena in the music industry. And Bruce Springsteen, who hadn't played an arena for six years, he normally plays stadiums because he sells our stadiums, wanted to come and play our arena. So uh, we, we actually had Elton John lined up to open, to open the arena, um, but Bruce said he would do the test, the test event. So we had Bruce Springsteen playing the test event in, in the arena. Now there's a wonderful story I've put to tell you about that. The, it, one of, the, 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 one of the, the biggest challenges we had was the acoustic um, breakout in this building. So the, the, it, I, you, should, you saw earlier its relationship to the surrounding residential buildings and such like. So the, really the idea was that we, we spent huge amounts of money trying to, to prevent break, sound breakout from the, the rock band inside. And, and unfortunately, Bruce Springsteen was playing a stadium set up to it, big speakers, it really turned up, turn up loud. And we were very worried because the council were testing the noise testing that day. Now, as it happened, halfway through the event, the police turned up and they were going, what, what's happening? Because there's been an incident. And the reason they turned up was that they couldn't hear the, the event happening inside. <laughs> which meant that we passed with five colours the sound leakage test. Um, but it was a wonderful event. Uh, and what was really fascinating though was that actually the council acted de as the developer in this particular case, which is quite unique and unusual. Usually in the UK, that doesn't happen. Um, and you know, the council sort of by various different funding streams put together a 60 million pound project, 60 million pounds. Uh, they kind of dropped this 60 million pebble in this district of, of Leeds. And within, you know, before we'd even completed the building on site, there'd have been at least nearly 60 million of private investment around this building. So the idea of using you know, an arena as a, a, a means of regeneration or urban stimulus is, is just a great case study in itself. So really, how can you use this, the, the, these buildings as a sort of you know, an urban generator? The idea, you, know, you, you need to look at the way that people approach the building. The great thing about Leeds, we didn't have any car park. We had six car parking spaces, which means you know, five, you know, three, three days a week, you've got nearly 12,000 people moving through the city centre of Leeds spending money, bringing life, bringing energy to the city centre. And really we want to look at how these buildings, these buildings work in connect, both in the immediate zone as their wider footprint, and even their regional footprint in terms of their, their brand and, and, and character and quality. Now, what we're particularly fascinated about is how technology is influencing that approach. So clearly the internet profile of a building is, is, is key. But also, can you actually use smart city technology to start integrate these buildings more, actually blur the edges of where the building starts and the city starts, where they come together. And there's some good projects that we've been looking at doing that. So in this one in, in, um, in Detroit, which we're currently on construction, uh, basically the, the arena bowl is actually in the middle of a, an urban block, and, and actually the shops around it are actually the, con the concessions in the concourse. So the, the street wraps around the building. 
as you can kind of see here with the section sort of coming through so you have the street wrapping around so the food and beverage the shops where you buy your burgers and such like is right on the edge of the building okay so that, 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 that's Detroit so I'm just going to talk a little bit about Barcelona so Barcelona um, arena so recently we won a, a competition an international competition uh, for to design a new cloud for FC Barcelona the world's biggest football club in my mind the Real Madrid would argue but where I'm from is Barcelona. Um, the, the competition was, was various different practices. We were up against uh, May for Wilkes Air, um, some local uh, sort of star protected Mugano's, who else was there? The American EMP, or probably the German sports architecture firm. Anyway, the competition went on. There was two competitions run at the same time. One was for the arena, and one was for the stadium. We chose the arena because it's new build and the stadium is, is going to have a long life to it because it's, it's scale size on the system. So this is a, this is basically the camp now. So this is this, this is Barcelona's home, the, the home of Catalonian football, almost spiritual home of Catalonia. And we're basically what people don't know about FC Barcelona is that not only do they have one of the best football clubs in Europe, although they didn't win the European Championship they did last year, they also have one of the best basketball teams in Europe. And they also have the best football team as well. They're much more than a club, than a football club. Mm. And, and really, they, they wanted to create venues for the new venues for all of these guys. So the brief was to design a new arena, um, a new football school. It's got a new ice ring. It's also got an auxiliary hall. And at the same time, they're developing the, the sort of wrapping the new fit out for the, for the stadium. We designed the whole new, new arena design complex. Again, it's right in the city centre, right in the very urban part of Barcelona. On the world's beautiful cities. What was particularly um, interesting about this building was its relation to the stadium. The stadium is enormous. It's nearly 100,000 seats. They're going to take it up to 105,000 seats with the, the um, with the actual refurbishment. But the, the arena itself has its, its own definition, its own gravity in relation to that bigger stadium. So how did that, that influence our direction? It's one of the key drivers in the architectural design of the building the way it relates to its urban fabric, the way it relates to the buildings around it. Um, so the building itself was, 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 you know, it's much more than an arena. So we had a 12,000 capacity arena. So it's, it, it, it's slightly bigger than Leeds, but it's also set up for a traditional North American sport. So it's a traditional model arena. Uh, we also have an auxiliary hall and ice rink. And then on top of that, we've actually got the football school, where people learn to be little messies. Um, people pay money to learn to play football. Um, we also looked at trying to optimize the site for commercial development. So actually bringing in some commercial plots and actually see how people can move through the site. And connecting the new metros through the site across to the, to the actual camp now itself. And the idea was we'd create this arcade, which is because of, there's a real typology of lots of different types of arcades in Barcelona. And, and the way that the building, again, nestled into the landscape. So it was a big level change between the top of the site and the bottom of the site and we wanted to connect through on those different levels to that building. So that just really some plans we sort of see through. You can see the arena there, you can see the skull, and how these all sort of connect through and the movement of people. As I said, experiential architecture often involves lots of people moving around. So you need to control the way they move, the flow, the dynamic associated with them. So this was a view back from the actual sort of the new cats are outside the camp now to, to the arena. Um, and I'll give you a little so one of the key aspects was it's, a, it's an existing campus which is, 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 is maintained. It's going to be the, while they're even building the stadium, they're still going to be using this 100,000 seat stadium. So we needed to look at all the existing assets and how that we would demolish them and such like how we would change them over time. So the design was very much driven by a program of events. So the ability for us to knock down the existing mini stadium, then build our new stadium before we actually then knock down the, the the existing arena and build the mixed use development. So the consideration of, of the design is not just how the building functions, it's how you deliver it within over time within the existing asset management plan. Okay. Um, so the, I sort of alluded to this idea that we're really trying to challenge what an, an arena can be. And, and we're doing that very much with technology. So, We've got some very bright guys on our team who write lots of code, 
So historically, when I learned to be an architect, draw. Now people write code. It's a very different world. I still draw. But, and the, the guys, so basically, we developed this idea of, of almost parametric design, which in my mind starts to raise lots of questions about parametric philosophy and how you approach design in response to technology. So the idea is we have computer programs and we can actually work out a perfect bowl in relation to everyone's experience. Historically, this is done by what's called a C-value. So a C-value is a, a mathematical calculation of what you can see from your seat to a specific focal point in relation to the people around you. So it's, it's basically the distance between the angle from your viewing to the focal point of the person in front of you. Now, this is a very complicated uh, thing to do. And it, what, what we're trying to create is a bowl, which is a parabolic bowl, which gives everyone the best view. Um, so using technology now, we can do that much quicker than we historically could which means we can start to look at how these bowls become far more dynamic and more interesting. Getting people closer to the action, getting people with better views, better action. So in the competition, you're in a competition, and you've got to take a choice in terms of how do you create value to the client, how do you win this competition. And our view was that the brief was to actually design an arena, a traditional North American arena, we say 6,000 seats in the lower bowl with an upper bowl, an upper terrace. Okay, but the cost was a challenge again. So we moved away from that. We said, look, like, let's try and get rid of some concourses. Let's try and save some money early on, some big savings. And we, we, we looked at the way that we could actually create a bigger lower bowl, but then actually create an extension <coughs> at one end in relation to the stadium. So really looking at this, 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 this gravitational pull from the stadium with the arena. Now, what is interesting is that um, basketball in Europe is very different to, say, North American basketball. It's more similar, the atmosphere and the character is more similar to that of football or soccer. And so, you know, can we look there? Can we start to look at some really famous football stadiums and see wh which ones give a real home advantage? So you can look at the yellow wall in, in Dortmund. Or Liverpool, if you've got the Liverpool fans here, the idea of the cop at Liverpool. It's, a, it's notorious, basically, a home advantage, the fan. This wall of fans baying, baying to win. And we wanted to take that character into this arena design. So the innovation was to create this big end, this cop end um, up, up in the bowl, to create this home advantage, this wall of sound coming out there. But that also had lots of actual additional advantages as well. By our modeling, by using our parametric technologies and such like, we could work out how this bowl performed compared to a traditional model. And the idea was that people get a lot closer. So a lot, of the, a lot more of the seats are close to the action than you would be with a traditional with an upper tennis. The other aspect was we could actually optimize the cost of the building. So the challenge we have with these buildings is they're big buildings. They have big spans, and you're, you're at the edge of physics. You know, we're talking big structure. Everything's big. Um, so the idea was, can we actually reduce this bowl in, get rid of that upper tier, that upper tier, and essentially reduce the structure down? So we went from a structural span around 125, something like that, down to 65, which is a significant saving when you start looking at the structural aspect. The other idea was to look at their existing cloud, their existing arena. We wanted to create the same intimate space, albeit the existing arena is only sort of five, 6,000 seats. We want to extend that up to sort of 12,000. So this idea of reducing this space, creating this very, very intense space is kind of cool as well. And of course, all this adds to the, the reduction of cost. So if you can compare a traditional arena, it's the red line, we can almost stick on already inside of it because you've done this big enough bit of moves. Now that comes down to a quite an interesting discussion about backing yourself. And like, you know, we truly believed in this. I mean, it was, a, it was a competition environment. Do we go with this or do we go with something else? We chose to go with this innovative design bowl. And this was the outcome. This was a bowl which basically was a big cop end for Barcelona itself with the fans in there. And then on event day. Now, of course, this bowl needs to convert uh, and, and it's a multi-purpose bowl. And the whole thing about these buildings is flexibility. So we designed the bowl in such a way that it could turn very rapidly into all sorts of different events. So we go from basketball to handball here. Actually, that's that's top sort of it. Um, or the next day it turns into a concert venue. So a big end stage concert venue with 12,500 people, maybe seated in this particular case. The next day it might be boxing. So the building has to adapt, has to change quickly and rapidly. Um, and the retractable seats, there's the change in relation to that. Now, one of the great advantages we had with this building was because we'd created this cop end, 
is, is enlarged into the bowl, we can essentially create a big super theatre, like Leeds. So suddenly you've got this opportunity to deliver um, meaningful end stage uh, entertainment, so big capacity stuff, you know, maybe 12 and a half thousand people. But also, you can pull the thing forward, pull the stage forward, and have a very intimate, smaller performance, so five, six thousand seats, or even smaller, where you can have like 10 lectures and such. Now, what's great about this is that this gives FC Barcelona, who has 100,000 people go to see their home games, a wonderful venue to go and see their away games if you can't travel. So suddenly you could host the football in there on, on, on none of that, on none of that. And it also meant that we could leverage, we could increase the actual event calendar by adding extra days in into that event calendar for the university lectures, for the corporate uses and such like. Of course, enhancing the actual revenue of the building and the usage. So this venue started to develop as a cluster, more than a club, more than a, more than a venue, a cluster of smaller little venues that were put together and used in lots of different different days of the year. So the organisation of the building starts with the lower ground floor. So with the service yard at the back and the atrium space at the front, with then club side either way. And of course we need to create a secure line to protect the people inside and control ticketing. But one of the big moves we did was, because we sit on the, hill, the hillside, another innovation was to create public rail all the way around this arena. And the idea was to use that so you actually ticket people as they move on to this what, kind of a podium. So the public realm becomes part of the concourse. And because of the Mediterranean climate, people can actually then hang around outside. You don't need to be inside most of the year in Barcelona. Let's use the outside. Let's use the natural ventilation outside. And people can enjoy their time hanging around the arena um, outside. So this allowed us to create secure areas at the edge of the, the, the building. So you're actually ticketed before you get to the building, which means you can move freely around the building. Um, and it also means that basically we could, we could do all sorts of dynamic things with that public realm. So now we can ticket the public realm, we can leverage it as part of the, the business plan and leverage it as part of the offer for the arena. So the plan was to take some of the concessions, the food and beverage outlets, which would normally reside inside the building, and drag them out into the landscape. Oh. And this gave us, you see, them, they see these guys here. So these are kind of like Barcelona chili depots or beach bars. And the idea is that they, these would sit in the landscape and, and they could be used every day of the week. So um, again, a building which is traditionally a black box suddenly becomes these very active edges with people going there every day of the week to hang out on this podium to, to eat, you know, eat food and beverage. Now the fact that these buildings are being used every day of the week means you can increase the actual um, catering offer, you can just have better food. So, because you're going to go there every day of the week. So rather than going to a, a football stadium and have a dodgy pie, you can go here and have some wonderful tapas. So it enhances the business plan again because people are buying more tapas. So the other idea was that we could start to use this public realm for all sorts of things, for festivals, for running tracks, sporting games, but also tournaments. They can set tents up in, in, in conjunction with the Astilda. People can hang around outside this arena. And they become very dynamic architectural elements that, that sit within that landscape. So everyone has a party. It means that after the event, you get people out in the arena. They can hang around. There's a dwell time there. They're still spending money, even though they're on the way out of the building. And there's this great congregation out there. You know, this, this wonderful sort of public realm which people can hang out and chill, and talk to each other and drink and enjoy life. Another key part of arena design is the way that you can leverage naming rights and sponsorship. So the idea of actually looking at how that Brand people, you know, basically the O2 London was paid for by its naming rights deal. So the building has been designed also to, oh, excuse me, also to actually leverage that those relationships with with, with with commerce. So the idea that from an early stage you can start to connect with a, you know, a, a sports apparel brand or a bank or whatever, and we're trying to create inventory or assets around this building, the architectural design stage that can be leveraged to basically create revenue at a later stage. So branding on the roof, the idea of like screen opportunities both inside the bowl and outside the bowl. And this all they connect through to the virtual world. So the building, you know, the lines between the, the actual physical building and the urban environment, then also the, the internet environment, that start to become blurred. Sustainability was a, a big thing. This is a big thing not just in terms of social responsibility, it's also a big thing if you're actually trying to attract 
in many rights as brand sponsors. They want to know that their building is big, that they're, they're sponsoring, because it's, it's part of their, their culture and their, their ethos. So the building was designed with a series of sustainability strategies. With it. So the idea is, you know, basically daylight, natural daylight to offices and such like, grey water demand, environmentally friendly materials and such like, using as much recyclable materials as possible, the adaptive environments, really modeling the building's performance uh, and on a day-to-day, -day, you know, and, and putting the right facade in the right location. So we're not having big glazed walls where it's got to our face and sun, we're creating shading and shadow in relation to that. Spent, you know, the, the idea though was that we would very much leverage the, the, the Mediterranean climate and reduce the actual internal air conditioned space, which in itself helps with the sort of environmental aspects. So this was just a, a video to kind of give an idea. And then the idea was that potentially we put, you know, photovoltaic panels on the roof, and there's lots of renewables where we can. Uh, rainwater harvesting was key, we used that as part of the actual grey water recycling and such like. And this idea of barrier free, so everyone can come in at the podium level and can move around. We have a top fed bowl that becomes very, very, very optimal. Oh. So the next thing was really taking all of these elements and then creating a wonderful architecture. This idea of poetry, poetic functionism in my mind. And one of the key fe features of the building was the architectural wrap, what we called the halo. And we wanted, you know, we've got a building that performs, but we wanted to create a building that has some, some indication of the energy and dynamic quality of performances inside. So basketball guys sort of thinking up through the air. How does that work? How does that find the architecture form? And this was a model we made just to sort of articulate that. And then really the idea was that this, this building was created with very practical materials, just you know, in an interesting fashion. So the halo became one of the key features, but essentially everything else is, is, is relatively straightforward construction. <coughs> um, you know, the acoustic mechanic, we, we, we took away some of the complex geometry and, and created that with a fabric roof because it's much easier to articulate with a lightweight material than a heavy material required to deliver the rigging mode. And really that just gives you an idea of how the building comes together in you know, sort of what we call a pie shot um, with the outside of the okay. <coughs> So the building itself, basically we're lucky enough to win the, 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 the competition and we're currently just basically developing uh, the design solution for, for construction, how, how it fits on the site. We're putting the outline planning application at the moment, and we'll be constructing the thing shortly. If you're in Barcelona, there's actually an exhibition on which has got both this and the stadium scheme, which is, is kind, of, kind of interesting. Um, so that, that, that's kind of arenas and how, how they can actually sit within an urban landscape and start to you know, really, really become part of that, become an urban anchor and actually sort of become a regenerator for that. But on a much larger scale, the idea of creating this experiential architecture to create a new urban city environment is quite interesting. So my team was lucky enough to be part of the Dubai World Expo team that we pulled together to, to actually help win the bid for Dubai to win the World Expo. So to give you an idea, the World Expo is essentially the World Fair. So the World Fair, the first one is in 1851. So Joseph Paxton designed Crystal Palace. Uh, and it was essentially a, a in my mind, the, the World Fair is it, it's almost a, a sort of a cultural and uh, technology Olympics, as it were. Now, what was great about this building is that, I mean, it's just fascinating to think what, what it studies. It's the awe and wonder that it actually portrayed. And, and what it also is interesting is actually, if you look, this, this, this building was built in Hyde Park. So if you know London or not, you may know the Natural History Museum, you may know the DNA. You may know the Science Museum. Now that whole district was actually paid for by the revenue driven from the 1851 Expo. So the Expo itself regenerated, completely changed that whole part of London. Now the big plan, basically the Expos, modern Expos are underpinned by a series of themes. So the overriding theme for Dubai was connecting minds to the future. And, and we really took that in, in hand and we really, we, we really dwelled on that. It was also underpinned by a series of sub-themes, so mobility, um, sustainability, and opportunity. So the actual plan of the master plan for the expo pretty much was underpinned by these, these, these elements. The idea of coming together, creating minds, connecting people, creating environments where people can come connect. But also the, the actual, uh, you know, the, the three themes together. So the actual design of the, the, the master plan was underpinned by three petals. And those three petals came together in the center, the meeting point, which we call the Al-Wazl 
the old names of Dubai, which is the meeting place. Um, and then around there, we have basically all the pavilions that wrap around this building. And there's a big convention and exhibition centre as well. Now, the intention was that this will define a new urban district in the future. So we go from Expo mode, which is an event that happens over six months. So the, the site is about, um, it's about 850 acres of hectares. But just to give you an idea of the scale of this thing, that thing there is Leeds Arena. Oh. So it's, it's enormous. It's, it's a pretty big site. Um, the, uh, oh. So over time, after the Expo, this whole district turns into a sort of urban city district, as you can see. So the, the pavilions, I hope, for each country goes away and in comes the new city. Now, the idea was to create, uh, essentially, as I suggested, these three different um, souks, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, these, these three different di districts relating to the thing. But we also wanted, with the legacy, was to create a series of parks that would, again, like, like, like London, become one of the sort of cornerstones of, of the urban fabric in the, in the future to come. And what I found very interesting is that, as an architect, when you design a building, it'll probably have a lifespan of sports buildings typically 25, 50 years, other buildings maybe 100 years, but the spaces around those buildings tend to last a lot longer. So the public bound, the streets and such like, will be there for centuries. And you can see that all around the world, how the public bound is defined. So really just in plan, you can see how that this was the original concept scheme. So that there's, there's basically this mix of pavilions from different countries. So you have some big countries like the US and Germany and such like have very, very affluent, sort of very prestigious pavilions and they have bigger key plots. And then as other countries have smaller plots and such like. And then developing countries, the intention was for a lot of the developing countries was to create house souks that you would give to the developing countries for them to come over. Uh, and, and the combination of all of these together became the planning of the actual architecture of the site. So we started to use some of the, 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 the key pavilions to create anchors to draw people around through the massive park. And then the host, you know, the, the, basically there'd be a mixture of um, uh, developing nation pavilions and uh, commercial pavilions in the cities. So this came into this master plan as such. Now the scale of this thing is, is pretty big. So the, the Shanghai Expo was enormous. So the Shanghai Expo, they had 72 million people through, through the site. 72 million people, that's more than the population of the UK. Through the site in six months. We're not, we're not getting quite as much as that. I think we're looking at about 25 million people in six months, with a peak day of maybe 300,000 people. But 300,000 people is a lot of people. That's, that's Wembley Stadium, you know, that's three Wembley Stadiums, or American Hour Wembley Stadium, you know. Company, all operating at the same time. The operational side of that is just enormous. That flow of people, and everyone's got to have a good time as well, right? Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the thing. So the idea was that you know we, we had to you know we had to look at the crowd movement, the way these buildings react with each other and such like, and the public realm in particular. How does that respond with the park's design? Here is the sustainability park. So in the centre is the sustainability pavilion. And then this one is, is basically... Sorry, what's the structure? Sorry? What's the cladding on top there? The what's the skin here? Yeah. Well, Fabric? this is just a massive one. Oh, but you, so you haven't... This one has just been won. So the, each of these components go out to competition. Oh. So I think this one's just been won by oh. BRK. Oh. Big, big. I, I suspect it's... I think, yeah, I think it's, it's got... Is it each country? Is each one of these the country? Yeah, essentially, yeah. So the, 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 the big one in the centre is, is a, a house pavilion. So that's a sustainability pavilion um, but around it will be all these series of other countries. Yeah? So we've just given some indication of what the pavilion is, but we're not designing the pavilion, we're designing the master plan. But we wanted to articulate the character of this master plan. So we kind of came up with lots of But the architects are free to move out of this, or this is incorporating the architecture sort of projects that's one going into it? We designed a master plan that and we hand over the plots. Okay. And then each country will determine. It's, it's completely so it doesn't have to end up this way. No, no. Yeah. Right. It's just but a master just plan. Just to give it, it's a yeah. master plan, but right. it gives an idea of the public realm of, of what yeah, the content absolutely. And how it So this was this was basically so this is basically we did the bid stage, we won the bid, and then we developed the scheme to the concept stage, and now it's been evolved from the concept stage to the actually delivery stage, um, which we're not actually working on at the moment. But this this gives a a view of the this is the. Uh, this is the opportunity um, 
park, which relates to the big UAE pavilion, which has been designed by um, I think it's Cal Travel. Cal Travel. Yeah. And then just this is a this is the opportunity. Oh no, it's just an ability pavilion at the park. So what, what I kind of like to talk about is this, this idea of experiential architecture. And, and really, of course, when you're designing things, you need to look at the physical circumstances. Where the well, sun, what is the topography? What is your underlying vision? What's your philosophy? Um, but what I find particularly interesting is the human experience and the connectivity between the visual character and almost the layering all these things to come together to create something which is interesting, compelling, and look wonderful. And to, to me, it, it, it's almost this layering that the, the, how you actually, after a while, a project will define its own destiny. If you can start to create these layers in such a way, it makes its own decisions. One of the things we wanted to do was look at the, this idea of creating community. So how do you actually get people to engage with other people, especially in events as big as this? So we wanted to break it down to a huge scale. So my father-in-law is, is an Oxford prof, and he talks a lot about this evolutionary psychology and how that communities have evolved over time in terms of series of sizes. So how many friends do you have on Facebook? There's about 120, I think it is. It's a typical size, you know, which is called the Dunbar number. So if you start looking at how you start to master panel zone, how you can cascade this, this, this creation of a community, it becomes quite interesting. And that was one of the drivers for this. And the idea was then to take that and look at actually sort of a, a vernacular architecture, the idea of a souk, such like, which obviously ties very, relates very well to the actual um, the environment and the, 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 the climate there, can we actually create a, a modern suit? And how do, how do we define what a modern suit is? So this was the bid stage where we started to create these communities over cascading the scale of these communities together. Nine times shots. But then, we, again, we started looking at actually using a sort of almost a parametric philosophy to create, essentially create, basically writing software that can determine how the suit will outcome. So we create an organic form using technology, but we set a series of parameters that define that. So be that you know sun analysis, massing parameters, facade parameters, slab parameters, and such like. And we feed those all into a very complex model, and that helps us to generate a new urban, urban typology. So that becomes very interesting. Because we then look at the way that people move from these spaces and connect together, the scale and size of these buildings. And then the idea was that these would all have different sort of you know certain would be. Um, Developing countries rented for the would be given and such like, which kind of comes together. And then these all came together in sort of hierarchical distances between each of the walking distances and such like, so as you would with a normal urban plan. And the idea essentially that we could like the souks and the souk characteristics come together to create this very rich urban environment. The souks are actually being redesigned at the moment, but this was just a bit stage, a concept stage. We also looked at the way that the, 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 the users actually operate within the venue. So we look at every different type of user, and how they actually view this master plan, how they move through the site, and how they actually engage in it. Um, and that, that's quite a complex process. But the idea that you actually map their journey through the day, and map the actual usage through the day and the night. One of the, the exciting challenges we had at the big stage, and certainly the concept stage, was creating public realm and shade. There's lots of queuing going on at Expo, and we wanted to get away from that as much as possible. But one of the ideas was to create public realm that comes together with a big shaded structure. So if you look back at Expo, the Eiffel Tower was more like from an Expo. It would be the, the kind of key, key element. You know, if you take the scale of this, we, we, needed, we need something like that. So we created this shade structure, which basically combined the actual uh, the shading structure of the, 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 the public realm together. And the idea was that the shading structure would be much more than just a shading structure. It's there for creating, you know, it creates hot, hot, hot energy. It becomes a dynamic wayfinding medium. It becomes an immersive experience. It becomes part of the experience of going to the event. So the, the shade structure itself, we had this idea that it, it, was, it was almost seven elements that come together in the centre. And the seven elements would be the seven uh, emirates of UAE. And the idea is the centre of this, this, building, this, this place becomes the outlast of the meeting. Um, and then we looked at you know traditional Bedouin uh, tents and such like, and how we can layer the tents and how we can layer the shade structure in a single way you know, to create culture. So this is an image to sort of show how the thing comes together in the centre. And then there was this really big meeting place, the Al Wazel, where we can almost have sort of 40,000 people congregating at the start. 
Now the key to this is that actually the shade structure is made out of very practical materials. So it's taking existing technology bricks and putting them together in a, in a new and interesting fashion. So you've got standardized PVs coming together with cable nets and fabric to create an interesting form. And then the idea, you use projections and LEDs and such like to create this immersive environment. So you can move through the space and we can actually use this, this, this shade structure to move the crowd around, to move them from different points to the next. And then during the day, it creates shade, it becomes part of the energy, but at night it comes alive and it becomes part of the entertainment. So rather than fireworks, we have this shading structure changes color and all sorts of dynamics. So really, I think, you know, just to sort of summarize, I've, I've probably gone on too long, I no, one, but the, there's quite interesting trends of how that people start to use these entertainment buildings. And I think the way that people are coming together at this is very different. So actually traditional groups, you know, sitting in a long line, maybe we should be creating stadiums where groups of people can sit around and enjoy each other's company before having an event. Maybe we, should, we really need to accept the fact of technology and how that actually starts to inform our architecture, how, how it informs our experience. Particularly if you're watch, watching a sporting event, how does that come together? How is you know, the future of, sort of robotics and drones? We didn't see drones on site in you know? All of these things need to be considered. But what I'm particularly excited about is that how, what's unique about these experiential buildings is that lots of people coming together. So how can we get all of these people working together to become part of that architecture? So the movement of people starts to create the dynamic facade, it starts to create the energy, it becomes part of the theater. It makes it unique. Rather than watching on TV, you want to watch, you want to go there, you want to spend time there. And, and that's kind of really exciting. And this can manifest itself in all sorts of ways in terms of kinetic sculptures, energy, and that sort of thing. All right, you're good. It's all right. You've got five more minutes if five you want them. Minutes. It's okay. completely up to you. If we okay. want to take questions, is yeah, that something? It, yeah. Well, thank you very, very much, John. It was in, in, inspiring. It's excellent. What do you think? I think I shouldn't be asking a question because you guys should be asking. What do you think was the word of the day today? I was counting. Which word did John say today a number of times? I, I reached 120 and then I said I stopped. No. What? Any other word? Did you hear a word a number of times again and again and again? He said people, people, people. He had said people so much times that I was, got, I was really so much touched by this. In the slide before also, you had the people and connectivity. Just two, three slides before. Uh, it's, yes, we had, what attracts people is first of all other people. And it was all about people. It didn't touch upon public realm. And this is something we always miss. It's just because teaching architecture students and, and their idea of of concepts approach when they come to things like museums or when they come to things like oh we're having a stadium it's, it's, it's a stadium it's all enclosed they never think of what's happening outside when you show the sleeve you spoke a lot about the people that are walking out the, the buildings around you you were considering the community you said community as well that was the other word I wonder what's your take on that yourself the, well, the people the community and stadiums I mean it's quite it's quite interesting obviously in some ways you can get lost in the object, you can get lost in the, in the, um, you know, in the form and the philosophy and such like. But in my mind, you know, architecture is, it is this sort of layering all these different factors and it, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's the experience of that building that's the form of that. And you know, that might be a philosophical experience and maybe a practical experience. But I, I do really like this idea of poetic functionalism where you can move beauty, art, form and such like together with people to create community. I, I just think that's very interesting. Well, it's it's be, so not just creating architectural big sculptures. It needs to be more than that. It needs to function as a business. It needs to function as a building. But more importantly, it needs to function as part of that community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Guys, the floor is yours. You can ask all the questions you've got now. Let's put the lights on a little bit. Just wanted to pull it as deep as I wasn't very sure when they first said we have to move here, but I found it quite nice and airy, and if we're here for a long time, it's good we have the natural light in as well. Okay, questions? We're here. Have you got questions? Okay. I think if it's difficult for them to ask, I will. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I'm just recording that I was talking with Shireen that uh, I did my graduation for in 1993. I did the uh, Olympics. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
highly trained secure committees, tech people. All of these factors come into the, the discussion associated with it. Fundamental from day one. And then, you know, you need to get that right, and that is your first priority, is that people are safe in this building. And, you know, that's kind of, it, it's a very specialised typology, and, and that's why there's not that many people who do it well, because it is a significant task. Well, thank you. I thank you so much. I'm quite, you know, grateful you've managed to make it today for Lincoln. Uh, can we all uh, just...